are going to continue um, on this uh, vein and topic of uh, sustainable growth um, and sustainability. Uh, we are going to be joined uh, by Mark Deswan Ahrens, uh, who's going to share some thought-provoking ideas and insights with us first, and then he'll move on to host uh, his own panel, which uh, I guess his ideas are going to be so thought-provoking that we needed another chair so more people can come in and, and uh, have a conversation with him. Um, but just to say, so like Mark is a newer friend. Uh, we've met just a few years ago. But it's a neat thing, because like, um, especially if you're in the MBA, uh, you would have seen his name in our reading list. So it's always a neat thing. Like, like you know, he's a, th a thinker, a developer of ideas within marketing. Uh, and it was just neat for me to see somebody that I had read his work previously and then meet to the men in person and then get to work together. So everybody, please welcome Mark Deswan Irons. Thank you, Felipe. Just a little hype. Not yeah, all the yeah, hype, yeah, exactly. I, I, I was ready to say I was young and I needed the money, but you didn't, <laughs> you didn't go too far. Um, good afternoon. And... Um, Indeed, my, uh, my role is just to uh, set up a panel discussion. And um, you heard um, Philippe and, uh, and Andrew, of course, talk about the three thrusts. And this is really about the second one. Um, and I'm going to do that by making the case actually to talk a little bit about the role of marketing, but before that, the role of business in sustainability and in sustainable growth specifically. The title was chosen quite carefully, but as I was listening this morning, I saw a second meaning because uh, Philippe talked about a crisis of confidence, and then perhaps we need to also think a little bit about the sustainableness of marketing itself. And, and why do I say that? Well, because um, at the moment, the influx into our discipline, into what we do, is declining. Just in the break, as we were having discussions, somebody said to me, you know, marketing is about selling things that people don't need to people that don't want them. It's not a good thing when that's said about what you wake up for every day. And that's the most junior marketers, if you like, the people coming in. But I want to take you back to a moment uh, about four years ago when I was invited into the room to the most senior marketers. On this picture, you will see the CMO, literally the top 25 in the world. You've got Procter & Gamble and Unilever, VML, um, um, LVMH, I mean. And, um, and, and all the other big players. And they had a crisis of confidence. They were supposed to give direction to the ad industry, which was walking outside in Cannes. But in fact, it turned out to be a little bit of a group therapy session around loss of influence on business growth. So now we've got the most junior people and the most senior people of our industry, of our discipline, complaining. Reason to set up something where the IRG and um, the FOMI have been collaborating from day one. Really to think about what does it take to win at a business level and at a marketing level. And I can't summarize the findings of all the work we've done together except to say that the businesses that are outperforming are defining growth in multi-stakeholder terms. So let's go a little deeper into that definition and I've lost my monitor here. If I can have it back, that would be great. And let's talk a little bit more about sustainable growth and take a step back. Now, this is interesting. This morning when I was dressing, there was a, on TV, there was a segment about Queen Elizabeth and a documentary, I really want to see it myself, about her this weekend on the BBC. And she said something profound, I thought. I mean, it's unimaginable. But she said, my first prime minister, Winston Churchill, said, the further you look back, the further you can look forward. What wise words, huh? And um, I'm going to build on some words that, uh, and some sparring uh, of a, a more recent acquaintance, uh, Dr. Hirth, who has been teaching me a little bit about the history of our subject. And uh, I'm going to go right back to the first book I read about what we do, Adam Smith introducing concepts that still define how we work today. Freedom of choice and this interesting concept of the invisible hand. In fact, in uh, 1776, so the Americans were fighting for independence and he was writing about market mechanisms and how they would be better for all of us. And about 100 years later, 
Um, he, um, he, sorry, and, and the point he made was that if we all fight for our individual utility almost, it would actually be better for all of us. And this has been used for a long time, basically to tell governments and others to stay away from what business does. Alfred Marshall, about 100 years later, in, over in Cambridge, he said that economics was actually about the attainment of well-being. Now, his driver for that, and this, this is the first time that economics became like a subject, um, was really the, uh, the care he had for the working class and, uh, and the impact on them. And this term well-being was already mentioned this morning because for the longest time, well-being and business were associated with each other. I mean, literally, when Unilever started its, uh, in, in Port Sunlight in the north, it was horrible there. And they built a village, as one did when you started the company. You built a factory. You were there for 75 years. You didn't pollute the waters because you drank them. You didn't exploit the people because they were your neighbors. That's what business did. Now, I've presented this slide to a few Americans um, in my day, and they all roll their eyes and say, yeah, those Europeans, and that's bullshit. Because in the same year, Hershey created a village with healthcare and kindergartens and, and, and training. So this concept of business doing well and actually creating good is not new. In fact, it's how things used to be. And when uh, Smith talked about the invisible hand, he was probably thinking about millions of small companies acting almost as individuals and making their choices and driving utility. He wasn't thinking about the Industrial Revolution and this enormous concentration of power that we saw because business was consolidating. And he wasn't thinking that actually, and they're called the, the robber barons, you know, that a few people would exploit to their own benefit, and lots of people would suffer as a result. And, uh, and he probably wasn't thinking that, you know, literally a few very visible hands were controlling the economy and industry as they have in so many things. Or as George Carlin likes to say it, the invisible hand of Adam Smith is actually maybe a stuck-up finger to most people. So it's not a surprise that there's been a force pushing back to say, listen, you need to take responsibility, you need to do the right thing. This is 1953, it's not a new concept. But a lot of that was put to death when Friedman, in 74, wrote this concept of shareholder primacy. They are the ones that matter. He literally says, the only social responsibility of a company is to drive profitability. And if they do that, then perhaps their shareholders will give some of that money to, pro to charity or something, but as a company, you can't get into that business. And this has led the thinking and driven decision-making in all companies for the last 50 years. So what's been the impact of this shareholder primacy? And I've lost my monitor again. Um, well, did we really see that the individual choices led to the betterment for all of us? Well, the interesting thing is, of course not. Because that assumed that we as people would vote in two ways. We would be consumers and give guidance to companies which ones we liked and which ones we didn't by buying their goods. And as citizens, by creating governments and legislation that would regulate industry and companies. But that's a false, a false assumption. Because what happened was companies quite quickly started lobbying for really short-term, myopic interests and it led to was a dashboard of metrics that we now look at and go, how could we? I mean, literally, if you take the definition of GDP, which we all think is a good thing, it's a nice, woolly, warm thing. Well, actually, in terms of GDP, a dead tree is worth more than a live tree. How absurd is that? Or when you reuse food, it's bad versus actually buying new food, throwing it away and buying it again. When you insulate your home, it's bad for GDP. Well, when these are the guiding metrics of the day, we know we're in trouble. And it's no surprise. I was in uh, Mumbai this weekend and in Bangalore yesterday, actually. And this is what it looks like. Of course, society is going to push back on companies. So what's been happening, and I'm going to just summarize this in an almost embarrassing uh, speed, is that business, of course, gets this, and business leaders want to do the right thing. But the credit goes to, I think, uh, Gates in 2008, when he started saying, listen, we've got to change how we run capitalism 
because it's just not tenable. And we've seen a whole plethora of terms to try and modify capitalism to something that's acceptable. And actually, very importantly, Porter, the strategy guru, in, and I think it was 2011, he brought this concept of shared value, which starts to get to the multi-stakeholder value creation concept. But nothing really changed, because CEO said, my shareholders just want profit. It's that bloody Friedman. Until this guy wrote a letter to all the important CEOs of the world. He happens to be the biggest shareholder. He's the institutional shareholder you need to care about. He invests not for the two-year quick gain, but for the 30-year, he has my pension at mind, growth that is progressive and that is um, you know, long-term perspective. And what he wrote was, look, I want to know how you're going to do financially, but I also now need to understand how you are creating value for all the people the society, the world around you. And that's when the CEOs jumped into action. It took less than a year for them to rewrite, after 50 years, this bloody Friedman statement about the focus on just profit. And they rewrote, literally, the statement of the purpose of the corporation. And they said, all our stakeholders are essential. We commit to delivering value to all of them. And then COVID struck six months later. Now, this is important because what typically a crisis does, it accelerates things. And I would argue here too, because surely no one would argue that now we're not much more empathetic. Even the most cynical CFO understands that you need to ask, how is your family? Are they safe? Right? And literally, the, the division between my work life and my personal life has disappeared. We now know who has a cat because they walk through the screen. Or we heard their son say, can I have an ice cream where we're in the middle of strategy discussions? And we've learned that the brands that were clear on their purpose moved fastest, were most impressive, and were genuine because they knew what they stood for. And now I want to introduce why marketing is important. And what I think is the massive opportunity that we have to turn this crisis of confidence into a big opportunity. Because when these people, these CEOs said, we're going to create value for all stakeholders, what they implicitly said is, we need to understand what moves them, what their unmet needs are, what value is in their minds. Now, those are things that we were trained to do. That's almost, I would argue, the definition of marketing. So these CEOs need help like the one at Unilever collaborating with his CEO, I would argue this is the Iggy guy of marketing. This is where we get the beautiful hotspots, the sweet spot between what the world needs and what we're absolutely great at. Because what is it that marketing does? Two perspectives. Internally, we are the people that actually help bring the outside world in. Antonio Lucio at Meta, his last role as a CMO, He's the window of the world. We have to bring in, and especially if you're now understanding all these stakeholders, this role becomes even more important. And we, like Norman de Greve at CVS, where the CEO is a very smart, but slightly dull, see, financial person, we are the ones that inspire the organization about this new vision of moving from a pharmacy business to a healthcare business, actually helping people get healthier. We, the CMOs, are the ones that actually build the communities, like Julia Golden at Lego, literally saying, how can we grow? How can we do this together? And we are the ones that work with CHROs to think about employee proposition. What is it that we actually offer as a career? What is it that you need as a colleague? And how do we, as a business, work towards that? And ultimately, we're also the ones, because we know channel management, that are able to tie all the things together and make sure that it's consistent across all the touch points to all stakeholders. That's what marketers do. So we're great partners, but there's more. Because as marketers, we touch more people in the world than any other discipline. We actually help drive how people think, how they feel, and what they do. And I don't mean a few people, I mean billions of people through our communication. And now I'd like to pick up what Elaine said about the, the brands at Reckitt, because if we challenge ourselves as marketers, as companies, 
to drive our brand growth, but do that with sustainable development goals as the secondary goal, as the doing well by doing good, and I would argue every brand can, then our growth is also what the world needs. And I would argue that for everyone, there are examples where you can find that your brand growth goes together with one of those SDGs. Whether it's Dove, that's been arguing for 25 years now about gender equality and literally about the fact that what you see in a magazine is probably not real, or even Hellman's, who's getting a lot of nasty press at the moment, but I think it's brilliant because 50% of all food in the US is wasted. And the number one ingredient to get the stuff that's in your fridge is left over to be interesting to eat again is actually mayonnaise. I think it's wonderful. It's so smart. Now, how you feel? I mean, think about Tony Giocoloni. The whole chocolate industry has prematized because we don't want to buy stuff that was created by kids, that was literally involving slave trade or some form of it. And yes, it's more expensive, but the whole industry has moved. Or just feeling confident about something that's extremely normal within the family in Africa, understanding that you can't miss school because you've got a period. It's good for always, and it's good for society, I would argue. Or acting better because you're literally, you're turning, you're not eating beef as much, or you're turning the tap off earlier, or you're helping people uh, you know, wash at lower temperatures. All of these things are brand growth and SDG growth. So I end there because I would argue that actually, and this is a stat from our program, the CMOs that get involved at that level have more influence. That's what they tell us. That's one. And I think the students that you ask, would you like to join an industry that touches the lives of billions and gets them to think feel and do better, that's probably a career I'd like to get into. So my challenge to you and to the panel that's coming up right now is to say, if not now, when? And if not us as marketing, who? And with that, I'd like to invite uh, my colleagues to discuss this. Thank you.